Um, you know, Aristotle's really known for saying we're political animals, right? Uh, but later philosophers have said that we're storytelling animals, that, that we have to live in a narrative or else we just don't make sense, which is why we tell stories, yes. why we create these stories. Yes. And when it comes to scripture, it is the truest story that we're participating in. Yes. And it's interesting that God revealed these things and, and to future generations, it's, it's a narrative. It's something that we're participating in. Um, maybe say a little bit about how story itself really forms a lot of that. You're exactly right. I mean, it's for so many today, life is a story with no plot. You give your life meaning. You, you be yourself. You express yourself. And then Rothschild has got a great line in Introduction to Christianity. He says, meaning that is self-made is at the end of the day, no meaning at all. If it's simply my fabrication, it's, I know deep down it's hollow. What we long for is meaning that's received um, ultimately from the Lord and, and, and that we have a part to play in this great story. So I, I, you're exactly right. And I think for, whether it's as Catholics, uh, as people of the West, uh, people in the U.S., we've lost our story and we don't know who we are. We don't know where we've come from. We don't know where we're going. And consequently, we don't know who we are. So I, I think this is, you talk about like raising kids. I mean, what am I? my most favorite memories as a dad. I've got six kids, um, 17 to two months right now, um, is reading to them, reading great stories to them. I didn't even realize at the time, but like they, it, like reading Narnia, for example, but I mean, but there's so many great stories, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, yeah, but, but even beyond that, but it gave them a medium to think about things that were beyond them. Uh, I remember, you know, when one of my sons was like, well, so what are demons? I'm like, well, you know, orcs, they're kind of like corrupted elves. Like, oh, I get it, dad. <laughs> right off and play. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, and then one of them one time said to me, because my, my line was always this. They would say, is this real? And I'd say, well, it's not real, but it teaches us about something that is real. And I was trying to get them to think typologically. Like, like this is, you know, this is teaching you about something that is real. Uh, even though we're not going to go like find Narnia next door. And then one day one of my sons goes, no, no, dad, Narnia is real. I'm like, oh, we've been through this. It, 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 it's not real, but it teaches us about something that is real. He's like, no, no, you get there through the wardrobe of death. I'm like, what just happened? And, but, but his, his whole, I mean, in other words, it triggered things in them that I couldn't have like concocted on my own, but it's just the power of story. And they're like, you know, the wardrobe it takes you to Narnia. Narnia is like an image of heaven. Death is this door, this gateway. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Happened, you know, but it, it, the power of story to shape their moral and spiritual imagination affectively at the emotional level that tills the groundwork for catechesis and intellectual engagement later on, to me, has been one of the most powerful things that I, I kind of came to as a dad almost on accident, but I'm just so grateful for it. So, yeah, I, I, we've lost our story. We need story. We need to know who we are um, and whether that's liturgy, art, study. I mean, like, who are we? Uh, we've got to recover that and we will not do so unless we reclaim the fundamental story of creation, redemption, salvation. Yeah. It was told to me once that if you are a connoisseur of literature, you, you end up living a thousand lives because you've lived through these characters. You've lived through, you know, the mistakes that they've That's made, true. the freedoms that they've earned, the, the grace that they've experienced. Um, and so when it comes to the Old Testament, getting back yeah. to, to that part of our conversation, Gosh, you, you talk about learning so much about human nature, about where our story is and yeah. how we play a role in that. Um, and what I love about, especially the Old Testament, is that you've got a lot of people that make a lot of mistakes, right? <laughs> and we all make mistakes. It's called sin, right? That's the, that's the reality of it. Um, but you see through those actions and through those mistakes, God is still finding his way to work through it. He's, he's putting together a story that's much bigger than ourselves. So even though we're fallen creatures, even though we make these incredible, horrible mistakes and we, we harm each other, we do all kinds of stuff, God is still working. God is still pushing us towards ultimately salvific you know, uh, life in Christ. Um, and so what I love about literature especially, and, and again to, to think of, of the Old Testament more in a literary perspective, uh, is that it, it, it forms the mind in what it means to be human and human nature. And to your point, we've lost that today. And it seems to me like people, because of that, we've lost what it means to be human. We've lost our, our yeah. human nature. And what is it, if you don't know your nature, ultimately, <laughs> you know, you, you end up becoming beasts yeah. again, right? I just think about how, you know, we think of history. 
I mean, I think of my, my father-in-law, for example, I, I, when he talks about it and has a great love of history. And, um, and I think this was, a, this was an older approach to history. You study history not just to recover, even today is true, it's not just to recover the facts. I mean, what you think is important from the past has a lot to do with what you think is important now. It has a lot to do with the present as well. And when my father-in-law would speak about history, it was often about lessons we derive from history. Whereas I think so often now it's either, look how terrible we were, right? And there's no need to like whitewash things. Um, look how ter you know, terrible things were and how great things are now. Um, or it's just like a million pages of footnotes um, it, this kind of hyper, uh, kind of empiricist, um, all we want to know is just the facts. And, and I get that that's important. It's kind of like our question with the Bible, like the historical critical thing and then what's it mean? But I think part of it's how we think of history and why history is important and why kids often today don't care for it. Because if we just present it as random, disconnected facts, it's not their story. It doesn't have to do with who they are. It doesn't impact them existentially in the present. I think analogously, reading scripture the same way. It's not just about the past, it's about knowing where we came from, what we can learn, uh, and, and how we can you know, play our part in this great story. I mean, history is never just about the past, it's, all, it's always also about the present. That's why sometimes you have different generations will evaluate previous historical epics differently because the generations have changed, for better or for worse, the perspective has changed. And I think we're naive to think that that's not the case. Um, I think there's a need to recover history, uh, certainly biblical history, in a way that's, again, not, not naive, not uh, inaccurate, um, not whitewashing, but really seeing that the meaning of history is about our need to know where we came from, who we are, uh, and, and to learn moral lessons from the past. Like, is that a dirty word? I mean, this is why people loved history back in the day. I mean, hundreds of years ago, and part of the Enlightenment view of history, historiography is like, no, no, not that. We gotta get to the facts. It's like, well, I, we can do a little bit of both, but let's not throw the you know baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. What's cool too is you you see yourself in these characters, right? So I always think of you know George Washington really loved uh, Cincinnatus, the great uh, general of, of Rome, and he considered himself a new Cincinnatus. Like he considered himself doing something. Of course, he's on a much grander level than most people in human history will ever do. Uh, but to think of yourself of wow, if he was able to accomplish this or she was able to go out and, and you know conquer the world in this way, yeah. I too can do it because they're made of the same stuff, right? <laughs> Doesn't that make you want to study history? Yes. I mean, and, but you, you know, David thinks of himself as a new Melchizedek. He's a new priest king of Jerusalem, as Melchizedek was a priest king of Salem. Yes, yes, and yes, you're exactly right.